there, my name is Anna and it's FFA week, which means I'll be posting a video every single day. Welcome to What The Hey! Woo! <laughs> Since it's President's Day, I figured there'd be no better way to kick this fantastic week off than to look at past agriculturalists and study the struggles of former years. The FFA wasn't always the FFA. In the 1920s, Walter S. Newman, a vocational ag teacher at the time, discovered a huge problem. Farm boys were losing interest in ag. In an effort to fix the problem, he and a few of his buddies, Henry C. Grossclothes, Edmund McGill, and Harry Sanders, decided to start a club to get boys excited about ag again. In 1925, the Future Farmers of Virginia was born. The FFE, as well as a few other clubs that popped up around the country, became the foundation on which the FFA we know today was modeled. In 1928, the first national convention was held in Kansas City, Missouri. Not Missouri. 33 delegates from 18 states attended, and it was there that the National Future Farmers of America was born. Leslie Athwaite of New Jersey was appointed to be the first national president. By 1929, there were 35 state associations, and blue and gold were adopted as official FFA colors. In 1930, our pal Ian Tiffany wrote the official FFA creed, which we still use today. Shout out to all those people that caught it in my intro. You deserve a gold star. Also in 1930, the first form of official dress was created. A dark blue shirt, blue or white pants, a yellow tie, and a blue cap. The corduroy jackets we all love did not become a part of official dress until 1933. The Fredrickson, Ohio chapter arrived at National Convention wearing their own blue jackets and amazed everybody. Next time you go to National Convention, make sure you thank our friends in Fredrickson for creating such an important part of our organization. Now, in the 1930s, segregation wasn't a widely accepted idea. People of color were separated from white people, and the FFA was no exception from that. So, in 1935, the new Farmers for America was created for young African American farmers. The two organizations were very similar. Their creed and emblem resembled that of the FFA. However, they didn't become integrated until 1965. The FFA wasn't always as accepting as it is today. It's important to look back at all aspects of history, even the parts of it that weren't pretty. Without acknowledging our faults, we can't grow. However, the FFA does help everyone grow now. In 1937, the FFA Leadership Camp in Washington, D.C. was created and is still growing and teaching our FFA members leadership skills today. Ten years later, the National FFA Band performed for the first time at the 1947 convention. The National Chorus and Talent Search competition followed it the next year in 1948. The first National FFA Week was held on the week of George Washington's birthday in 1948. Sixty-nine years later, we're still growing strong! Future Farmers of America was granted a federal charger, which essentially makes it its own legal entity, in 1950, on the condition that a member of the U.S. Board of Education would serve as a national advisor. The first national FFA magazine was printed in 1953. Girls weren't always allowed in the FFA. Girls who had boyfriends in the FFA could get white sweetheart jackets and compete in sweetheart pageants, but weren't fully recognized members of the FFA until 1969. In 1973, the official dress standards that we know and love today were created. Of course, they can still change from time to time, though. The Future Farmers of America changed their name to the National FFA Organization in 1988 in order to be more inclusive of its members. We're not all just farmers, you know. In 1991, chapters were created in the Virgin Islands and Guam. In 2008, the National FFA Board decided to rotate the National Convention's location between Louisville, Kentucky and Indianapolis, Indiana every three years. In 2015, they decided to host the National Convention in Indianapolis between 2016 and 2024. I feel quite lucky I've been able to attend convention in both locations. If only I could invent a time machine to attend one in Kansas City. Well, that's all the history we have so far. If you'd like to read more about FFA history, check out the links I posted down below. Please like this video if you're glad that FFA includes everybody now, and subscribe so you can see what tomorrow's video will be. Hint, it has something to do with what I'm doing right now. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you know what to do. See you tomorrow!